He joins me, the Honourable Craig Murray. Thank you <coughs> for joining us. Um, before I uh, ask you where you are, you might not want to tell me because I did hear you were in Geneva uh, seeking sanctuary. Uh, let's uh, look at the 106th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, uh, which falls this month. <coughs> it is the case, isn't it, that Britain is the author of all this tragedy? Well, it's certainly true that the Balfour Declaration um, was the, the first um, practical step to the creation of the uh, Zionist state. And of course, Britain was given the mandate by the uh, United Nations to look after Palestine and, uh, and failed, to, failed to do so. Uh, and that, I think, of course, the concept of a, a European colonial settlement in the Middle East uh, was very much in line with, with British imperial <coughs> ambition. Yes, they wanted, didn't they, uh, a little loyal Ulster in the Middle East. And that's what it was for us very briefly uh, and has been for the United States ever since. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely uh, correct. And um, I think it's very important that we, we see it in that context, that, that Israel is a, a, a European colonial settlement in, in effect, uh, which has become, if you like, the, um, uh, the wedge end of American policy in a regime which it's determined to dominate uh, because of because of hydrocarbons, essentially. Um, so, so often international politics comes back to hydrocarbons uh, when, when all, all else is stripped bare. Although, uh, oddly, uh, given that Israel is an agent of the US rather than the other way around, somehow it all seems to have fed back to the metropolis. Uh, and uh, American politicians are prepared to uh, even people who called themselves anti-war, called themselves progressive, they're, they're prepared to support anything that Israel does. It's quite extraordinary. I, th I mean, I think the most striking thing outside, of course, of the terrible events in, in Gaza, the most striking thing happening in the world over this last three, four weeks has been the total dislocation of, of politicians from the people. We have a political class across the Western world, uh, which is absolutely enslaved to, to Israel, uh, is prepared to excuse the most terrible, imaginable crimes uh, if it's done by Israel, is prepared to countenance genocide, uh, is prepared to set aside every value they pretend they stand for, um, in the teeth of fierce popular opposition. And it's very difficult to put together exactly how this has happened. Um, in the United States, it's partly due to the Christian Zionist strength and the Christian Zionist vote. Everywhere it's due to um, financial support from, from Zionist lobbyist groups. Um, but also, it, it appears that politicians have got themselves into a situation where they just don't mix and socialize with anybody for whom support for Israel is not an absolute article of faith. That they, they just don't meet people who have a, a different view. And they are entirely disconcerted, I think, to find that you know a, a large majority uh, of people does not believe do not believe that, that Zionism justifies the genocide of the Palestinians. Craig, I'm so old. I remember when the Foreign Office, uh, for which you were a distinguished servant, <coughs> was filled with people uh, who took a very different position uh, towards Israel uh, than we're seeing now from. Rishi Sunak's government. I would meet officials in the Foreign Office, some of them very high officials, uh, who didn't have views much different 
from you and me on this subject? What happened? I think um, those people got got weeded out. Uh, I think there was an increasing politicization of the Foreign Office, particularly uh, I'm the civil service in general, but also of the Foreign Office. Um, I may have played a small part in that by, by accident. When, when I uh, was uh, sacked by the Foreign Office for my commitment to human rights and my opposition to extraordinary rendition and torture, uh, the Foreign Office had a seminar uh, to which friends of mine still in the office were were participants. And the uh, the subject of that seminar was how to stop people like Craig Murray ever getting into the Foreign Office again. Uh, so I, I, I think there has been a, a, a politicization of the service, making certain that people with, you know, anti-Zionist views would not get would not get in. Uh, but there's also been a tremendous deprofessionalization. I, I, I mean, you used to have to be a fluent Arabic speaker, for example, to, to serve in any senior position in the Arab states, or fluent Russian speaker to speak, you know, to serve in Russia, that kind of thing. You, you had to have a knowledge and understanding of geography and history and culture, and all of the, the infrastructure that supported that expertise, uh, which was extremely expensive. Uh, it's all been got rid of, uh, be, you know, in, as, as savings and cuts. So you, you you now have, you know, rather amateur pick box civil servants who, who run the Foreign Office. It is extraordinary. I mean, uh, from the days of Lawrence of Arabia, uh, a section of the British elite loved the Arabs. Now they seem to hate them. <laughs> yeah, no, you'd have to conclude that. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, it, and, and don't understand them. You, you, you know, our, our, our lack of, of knowledge and expertise of crucial parts of the world has, has become a real problem for the United Kingdom. Now, uh, those of us who love you and follow you closely know that you've had your own travails. Um, I don't know how much you're able to say, but do please say what you can. Yeah, I was um, I was stopped um, arriving back from Iceland from a meeting of the an international meeting of the coordination group of the um, uh, of the campaign against the extradition of Julian Assange. Uh, I was stopped uh, at Glasgow Airport under Schedule Seven of the anti-terrorism laws uh, and told I was being investigated for terrorism. I therefore was not entitled to legal advice. Uh, I was told I was uh, I, I ha had no right to remain silent, and I was asked questions uh, both about the Assange campaign and WikiLeaks and about my support for uh, Palestine. Um, subsequently, I was told that I am under investigation. I received written con confirmation that I am subject to a terrorism investigation, which is. Is ludicrous because, as you know, I'm I'm close to pacifist. I, I, I'm not an absolute pacifist, but I, I, I've been against war and violence my entire life. Um, and rather than uh, having you know already spent four months of my life in prison on on, on a ludicrous pretext, um, I wasn't going to stay stay around for him to do it to me again. So I decided uh, to come here for, to Switzerland and, and visit the United Nations and also put in a a formal complaint about my treatment to the United Nations, which I which I have done. And what's your status now? Are you seeking political asylum there? I'm I'm waiting at the moment um, while uh, my legal team in Scotland, headed by Arma Anwar, um, uh, while they try to clarify, you know, what what is this this ludicrous nonsense of, of a terrorism investigation. So um, uh, it, it, it may be this is just another piece of, of police harassment which is going to blow over. Uh, but and, and, you know, until that becomes clear, uh, I'm, I'm going to stay at the country. But I, I'm not at this stage uh, applying for political asylum. I think I'll avoid Glasgow Airport when I come back to the country myself. Although it happened to our colleague Kit Clarenberg at Luton Airport. So it seems there's no hiding place from this kind of absurdity. 
It's happened to it happened to um, Joanna Ross, who used to um, work for Sputnik in uh, Edinburgh, uh, who, who's a very nice lady who certainly has no connection to uh, terrorism. It happened to Vanessa Beely. Uh, it happened to Professor John Lockland, uh, who has worked for many members of the European Parliament, for example, in their offices and and and. and is, is quite a substantial figure again with no no earthly connection to terrorism um i've about six other journalists who have contacted me of course if you work for the bbc or the guardian this isn't going to happen to you but if you're anywhere in the uh, alternative media if you're anybody putting out a view uh, contrary to that sanctioned by the state then you're liable to be stopped and and of course because these are anti-terrorism powers, uh, it gives them enormous rights. All my electronics were seized, uh, that they've gone through my entire life. Um, uh, and, and of course, I'm not a terrorist, I'm a journalist, but they're doing this systematically against journalists who, who don't tow the neocon line. I mean, bluntly, I'm very surprised I haven't done it to you yet, George. <laughs> I expect you. <laughs> uh, maybe you're just too high profile. I don't know. But uh, it, it's very... Well, maybe, it, it's uh, become uh, maybe, very I, maybe I just haven't been home yet. I just haven't come home yet. Uh, uh, Craig, uh, the, uh, Lenin was in exile in Switzerland, in, in uh, Geneva, I think. And he went on to um, bring about a successful revolution. Maybe you'll end up doing the same. Heaven knows we need one. We, 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 we certainly do. And I, I, should, um, I should be delighted for that. But I, I, no, I shan't, be, I shan't be returning to the Finland station <laughs> anytime soon. <laughs> well, Waverley station then. <laughs>